Americans. Well, just how dangerous is the coronavirus? We know it kills, but so do many other things. The question is, what is the actual mortality rate? Dr. J. Bhattacharya is a professor of medicine at Stanford University. He's a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a senior fellow at both the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and the Stanford Freeman Spogli Institute. On March 24th, he wrote a controversial article in the Wall Street Journal questioning the premise that coronavirus would kill millions without shelter-in-place orders and quarantines. In the article, he suggested that there, there's little evidence to confirm the premise and projections of the death toll could plausibly be orders of magnitude too high. Professor Bhattacharya joins us exclusively here on Outsiders. Professor, how are you? doing well. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Now, just can you tell us uh, precisely why you upset so many people? They told you to get with the program. They attacked you. What have you done that's so wrong, Jay? <laughs> I, I don't pay very much attention to the press. Uh, I've been focused on trying to understand how many people actually have the COVID virus infection. Uh, and so the last few weeks uh, since that uh, since that abed, uh, I've been organizing or helping to organize uh, studies to figure out how many people have uh, antibodies to the virus in them, inside uh, inside their bodies, as evidence that they're uh, that they've had infection. Most people that get the virus actually are are going to have very few symptoms. It's obviously a very deadly virus that some people leads to hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, we've seen that in, in pictures all over the world. The question is, how large a fraction of the population is that? Uh, is, the, is the death rate 0.1%? Is the death rate 3% like the World Health Organization originally said? It's a big difference, one in a thousand versus three in a hundred. Uh, I'd, I'd much rather avoid a three in a hundred chance of dying than a one in a thousand chance of dying. Um, so, so the question, that's, that's the question I've been focused on, is developing evidence to understand how many people actually have been infected as a, uh, as a result of the virus. And how are, you, how, do, how are you finding that out? You said a couple of weeks ago that you were starting on, on research that hopefully by the end of April you would have answers to these questions. And the, without the number, the key denominator you spoke about that uh, determines just how, what the mortality rate is, our policy uh, directions are all over the place. How close are you to getting that denominator, that answer, and explain why it's important? That's a, sure. Uh, that's a really good, uh, good way to put it. So the... the uh, I have been working on a community survey of Santa Clara County in California. Also, I've been working with a group that's working in Los Angeles County, and we're going to have nationwide numbers also, I think, starting next week, um, nationwide in the United States, of course, uh, where we have done uh, basically a, a random sample from the population, where and they've come and they've given their, their blood to, so that we can analyze it and see, do they have evidence of these antibodies? Uh, from these studies, we're going to know, I think, within, I'll be able to say within next week, uh, how widespread the virus actually has been. Um, the way that, uh, the, why is this important? Well, for two reasons. One is, suppose uh, that, uh, what, what I anticipate finding is what we find, which is that the, 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 the disease is probably much more widespread than we think. That is, many, many more people have had it with, with relatively limited symptoms. Well, that means that the death rate from the virus is, is orders of magnitude lower than we think, nowhere near the 3% that the World Health Organization originally said. Uh, much lower, maybe more in line with the death rate from the flu. Now, on the other hand, it is important to realize that, that, that there's no vaccine for this virus, so it's still something to worry about. And actually, as you said in your intro, uh, a very reasonable policy would be to sort of start carefully lifting the restrictions. But how can you make that decision without data? Uh, the, 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 what I'm hoping is to provide a way to get that data, to make those decisions in a wise way. Uh, by, by understanding how extensive the, the, the infection is, we can our, the models that people have been using to forecast uh, whether hospital systems will get overloaded, well, they've been, they, they don't actually have good data to understand that because you don't know how many people actually have it. So uh, this is important to know because we'll finally be able to make good data-driven decisions about when it's safe to lift up, uh, lift off the economic caps that we put in place, uh, how to protect vulnerable populations from from the virus, because that's certainly still going to be a concern, even as, especially as we start lifting up the caps. Um, I think we have been flying in the dark with policy because we don't have this information about the extensive, the extensive spread of the virus. Uh, once we do, I think we'll start to make much better policy. Rita, 
Well, just on the herd immunity or just the extent of the uh, the uh, the population who've, who've encountered this virus, there's some research, I don't know if you've come across it yet, just come out of South Korea, that where they say they've got 91 patients who were thought to have been cleared of coronavirus who are <coughs> testing positive again. Now, they're not sure whether these people have been reinfected or it's just the virus has reactivated within them. They're not sure of that yet. But are we even certain that once you've had this virus, you've built up immunity to it or could you get it again and again? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot we don't know about this virus right now, uh, and, and in particular about the immunity, uh, whether whether uh, being infected provides long-lasting immunity, that's something that's actively under uh, investigation by a lot of people. And so I, I, I don't think we know yet that answer. What we do know, though, is that, that antibodies develop to the virus when you're infected with it, uh, and that those antibodies are evidence that you've had the infection. So if you want to understand the mortality rate, you need to know that. Uh, so, so the question of can you get immunity from an infection to the virus, that's still open. The question of do you develop antibodies in response to being infected, that's, that was pretty well understood. You certainly do. Uh, they probably provide some immunity, maybe not, not, not complete immunity. So uh, whether you can use the antibody presence to actually say, okay, it's safe to go back to work or not, that's not clear yet to me. Uh, but what is clear to me is that you, you can use it to really understand the mortality rate. Is it really more like one in a thousand? Or is it more like 3%? That you can certainly tell from the kind of studies I'm proposing. Um, I think, uh, actually, I, I want to address this, uh, a point that I think is really kind of sensitive but worth thinking about. Uh, we are uh, we, we basically say with, with things like the flu, which have mortality rates, something like 1 in 1,000, that, that uh, we're, we're, we're in some sense comfortable with it. People are going to get the flu, and some people are unfortunately going to die from it. Uh, and... Uh, we, have, we keep our economy open because suppressing the economy causes deaths of despair, uh, deaths, you know, poor countries are just unhealthier countries. Um, all kinds of uh, e economic damage is not just economic damage, it's, it's health damage that comes, comes from being poor. So the kind of trade-off we make is, all right, we're not going to su suppress our economy entirely because of a 1 in 1,000 risk from, the, from deaths from the flu. Uh, I think those are the kind of sort of adult decisions we have to make. What risks are we willing to take? Uh, and there are risks on both sides of this policy divide. If you su if you t suppress the economy, you're going to have to cope with the fact that, you're, that a lot of people are going to be uh, out of work. There's going to be deaths from despair, as we said. Uh, around the world, poor countries can very ill afford to have you know even small hits to the GDP. Literally billions of people's lives are at stake from a, a global economy that's not functioning well. So we have to we have to sort of make adult decisions about what risks we're going to take or willing to take from infectious disease outbreaks versus the the, the harm to health and 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 uh, livelihoods from economic economic uh, deaths. So I think the uh, the evidence out of South Korea is interesting because I think it's going to put squarely in front of us those kinds of very difficult choices. James. But I, I'm just interested also, I want to ask about some of the models that we've seen. You know, um, all, there's always been this sort of fight between a couple of models we had in Britain, for example. Um, the extreme models wind up in the political context being what politicians always go for because they use that to justify all of these restrictions that they're putting on them. But time and again, we're seeing that actually the models become far more conservative once actual numbers start to come in. Is this your general sense of it? And once we start to get a sense that actually it might be less, uh, less, less deadly than, than it is, that there will be a political pushback uh, that says we have to take into account these other lives that we are going to lose and destroy versus these ones that we're saving in the here and now who, when they're lost, make headlines. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's really right. Uh, I mean, I, I, I was uh, researching the H1N1 flu a while, for a while back, and the evidence there was very similar. The early, early reports were very, very high mortality rates, and as more scientific evidence came in, uh, the mortality rate numbers came down as, as, the, as people learned about really the true extent of the of the of the of the infection throughout the population, I went from like originally it was like one percent down to 0.01 percent. I think something similar will happen here. I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for for political leaders and public health officials that have to make very difficult choices on almost no information, no good information, and they're seeing you know evidence of people dying in front of them. Uh, it's it's 
it's, it's hard to make those choices. Uh, but I think we're very, very soon to be in a position where we don't have to do that anymore. We're going to have this information that we need to populate the models with real numbers uh, based on actual scientific studies as opposed to guesses, and then we can start to make good choices as a result of that. Um, I think we're headed in that direction, and uh, my hope is that very soon uh, we'll know these numbers around the world. I've been very encouraged to see that lots of other places are doing the kind of serology testing that I've been working working on in the United States. I think we'll, we'll very soon start to have a much better grasp on what this epidemic really is about and how best to cope with it from the policy point.